All right, we'll, uh, yeah, uh, we'll make a start now. Um, so let me just wrap. So uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining everyone. Thanks, Asa. So I'll first start with an um, acknowledgement of country, which is, um, um, oh yeah, so I celebrate and acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm joining you from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to the elders, past and present, and embrace a continued connection to this place. I'd also like to extend this re respect to elders from other communities where people are joining us from today. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Advanced Technology and Biology Division Seminar. So just a reminder to turn off the audio and video and to put questions using the chat function. However, Asaf did mention, Asaf did mention that he's also happy for people to um, uh, ask questions in, in between, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out in the chat box. So uh, for the seminar today, we have Dr. Asaf Zariski. He's a senior lecturer at the Department of Software and Systems Information Engineering, Ben Gurion University of the Negev, uh, Israel. The title of Asaf's seminar is Extracting the Invisible from Live Cell Microscopy. So Asaf is a senior lecturer, um, and he received his BSc and MSc degrees in computer science at BGU, and PhD in computer science at Tel Aviv University. He was a postdoctoral fellow at UT Southwestern Medical Center and joined BGU in October 2018. His research is in computational cell dynamics at the interface of data science and cell biology. Thank you for accepting, your, accepting our invitation and I look forward to this talk. So the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, I can give a seminar uh, to the other side of the world. Um, Please feel free to interrupt me during my talk. I'm 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 much happier with uh, you know feeling that I'm speaking to people and not to black screen. So so I I would be happy. I, I know that you you're used usually you are not used to that, but uh, but 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 this is my I mean if you have a question, then just feel free to, to interrupt me. So let's see. Okay. Okay. So my talk will be extracting the invisible invisible from live cell microscopy, and I'll start with a broad introduction, and then I'll give you uh, and then I'll give you two specific uh, two specific examples of projects uh, in my lab. So for for hundreds of years now. Uh, biologists, uh, we stare at the microscope, we see some phenotypes, we see something interesting, and we use that in order to understand better the world and to find new discoveries. And with that, hundreds of years now, uh, biology is, uh, is uh, uh, conveyed. And in the last several tens of years, this is not enough. And in order to convince the community that what we see is uh, real, uh, we need to quantify that. So we see a phenotype, and then we, we need to put numbers on that. Uh, what, what are the fraction or like or cell de or dead cell? Uh, what are the speed of the cells that are moving? Their size, morphology, whatever. And for this type of uh, typical tasks, uh, we have. Uh, I mean, we still need to develop a lot of tools, but there are already a flow of tools. These are three of them, uh, open source, and uh, ones that you need to pay for. Uh, anyway, there are now a lot of tools for the standard tasks of uh, taking images and extracting quantitative information uh, from them in order to quantify a phenotype and show that it's real. And uh, this is now, it's not, uh, it's not something that, uh, that is nice to have. It's actually a necessity, given the amount of imaging data that the modern technology is imaging, my biology, microscopy data that the modern technology give us. So here are three examples. So even if we had, uh, you know, poor uh, graduate students annotating manual events, now with these amounts of data, it's not possible anymore, and we must have automated the computation in order to quantify the events. I would like to say that even in, you don't need these amounts of data, even when you look at one image, one 3D image of, uh, of you know, of a cell, there is a lot of complexity and a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, details that uh, might, you might want to quantify and one might want, and, and that it's not, again, this is also, this complexity is also, you cannot do it manually. 
So in a recent perspective, uh, we, Megan, Driscoll, and myself, uh, tried to characterize a different task uh, in uh, bioimage analysis and uh, to characterize them as a low level or signal driven, which are the, uh, we, usually these are the first steps that we do in uh, bioimage analysis, segmentation, tracking, registration, and high level or biology driven tasks that are more driven into asking a biological question and extracting from this data a new knowledge. Uh, usually we start our uh, pipeline by defining uh, low level tasks, and then the high level task is allowing us to extract this information, process it, mine it, and uh, come out with the biological uh, uh, knowledge and insight. Uh, one of the cool things I think in this uh, field is that if in uh, standard computer vision, I'm coming, my PhD is from a computer vision lab. If in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in most of the computer vision tasks, the human mind is the gold standard, is the ground truth. You, can, you want to get as good as a human in understanding a scene. In, uh, in uh, biological data, in imaging data, in biology, uh, I think it's one of the only fields when the computer can do better than humans. And I'm going to show you a few examples. So uh, finding patterns in complex cell image data that the human eye cannot perceive. So given that, and I'm going to show you and to convince you, I hope, until the end of the talk that, uh, that it makes sense. But given that uh, some of the patterns are so complex that the human eye cannot uh, conceive visually, uh, we are proposing to switch the order here. And instead of first, looking at the images, understanding them, coming with an hypothesis and quantifying it to, 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 to validate it, we're proposing to switch the order here. And in some application, we propose to fir first mine the data computationally, look for the patterns and ask the questions using the computational tools. And then, uh, since we, it's not enough to find the pattern, we as biologists want to understand what's going on behind that, we need to do the extra step and this is what computer scientists usually do not do, uh, and they try to figure out uh, the biology behind it. So, uh, and, and in order to do that, we need to we, we need to have skills from both domains. We need to have data science skills. We need to know what tools to use. This is very important. What tools are available, and what techniques, and what, what can be done. But we also need to understand the, the experimental details. We need to understand what to look for, where to look for it, and how to look for it in the data computationally. OK, so I'm going to tell you uh, two stories today, if uh, time allows. Again, I'm not, uh, uh, I can, we can do only one or one and a half. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's fine. I can, I can stop at any point, if, again, if you have questions. Uh, uh, one about, uh, about uh, and, and these are basically the two main branches in my, in my lab now at VGU. Uh, one is the interpretable machine learning. I want to show you an example on how to interpret patterns that the deep neural networks uh, find. And the second is about processing uh, information as a collective in a group and trying to understand how collective behavior emerges from uh, single cells and interaction between single cells. So uh, do I need to give uh, an introduction for machine learning for this audience? I have uh, like, uh, I don't know, three to five minutes introduction. Uh, I think a very yeah, basic uh, one, three, three, uh, three, minutes, three minutes should work, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so crash course to uh, machine learning. Uh, this is an orange, uh, this is an apple. How could we tell apart? So the classic, uh, the classic uh, way to do it in uh, machine learning is uh, uh, building a supervised model. What is a supervised model? Intuitively, uh, you show the machine uh, many examples, annotated examples, or labeled examples of, of apples in oranges, and then the machine learns how to distinguish between them. When it gets a new fruit, it can say whether it's an apple or an orange. And more technically, uh, we have the data, we extract features which we think are informative in terms of making this distinction. So, for example, for apple and oranges, uh, we can say uh, we can take uh, features that are such as color, uh, texture, um, uh, I don't know, geometry, 
Um, maybe maybe roundness is not a good feature because uh, both of them are kind of round. I don't know. So we need to to engineer the features that will allow us to make this uh, call, which is which when we get a new uh, fruit to classify, and then we use this information and we train this and we train a model that can distinguish. So based on these features, this is a two-dimensional space, and uh, you can think about this in a high-dimensional space. Based on the features we extracted, uh, we train a model to distinguish between apple and oranges, and then the output is a model. It gets a new fruit, and it can say whether it's an apple or an orange. Of course, if you give it a banana, it will say whether it's more similar to an apple or an orange, right? It doesn't, it cannot uh, learn, it cannot infer uh, new fruits if it haven't seen it. So this is supervised machine learning. And another slide I want to tell you about uh, deep learning. Uh, so everybody probably heard about this buzzword. Uh, so deep learning, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively, well, it's actually not new. It's from the, from the 80s, it's a technique that was developed in the 80s, but only in the last uh, 15 years, it became a very powerful technique thanks to advance in uh, computation. And uh, now it's basically it re revolutionized uh, many, many fields. Uh, I mean, the most in computer science, it's mostly uh, computer vision and, uh, and uh, natural language processing, but basically now everywhere. It's, it's everywhere and it's completely dominating the world of uh, machine learning. And the power of it stems from uh, taking out the part of uh, manual engineering of features. So instead of deciding what are the features that we extract here, the color, the texture, the machine learns that automatically from the images. So the, all, all what you see here is an optimization process. So you give it apples and oranges, and the network adjusts its uh, weights here to automatically extract uh, 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 to automatically extract features that will allow it to to optimize the distinction the distinction between uh, apple and apples and oranges. So the powers of this of deep learning techniques stem from uh, the integration of automated feature extraction. No more, you need a human in the loop to extract the features, and model training. Of course, one of the main so this is changing the world, and basically all the machine learning today is uh, the most the vast majority of it is uh, is using this type of uh, machinery behind the scenes. Uh, it is very powerful in identifying patterns within data. Uh, its main uh, drawback, which is uh, I think uh, critical in biology and medicine, when you actually is, is is actually interpreting what the network have learned. If we do feature engineering, we know exactly what we extracted. We know we see that oh yeah, the color is, is different, we, the texture is different, and we can interpret that. Uh, these networks we just get a bunch of uh, artificial neurons with some values and, and weights. I mean, it's 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 like. It's very hard to interpret, so this is the main limitation. Okay, so now back to 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 a specific project. Uh, the questions that we asked is: Can we predict cancer cell metastatic states from live label-free uh, cell images? And in order to ask this question, and um, well, yeah. So the project is the title is interpretable deep learning and cover cellular properties in label-free live cell images that are predictive of highly metastatic melanoma. And uh, we used these machineries, in, in very short, we used these machineries of uh, deep learning and we were able to distinguish between high and low metastatic efficiency uh, cells. But then the challenge was to actually interpret what, what, what the network have learned because visually we couldn't see anything. So I'm going to quickly go over this project. Uh, so the model, we were very fortunate to be, this was a, uh, during my postdoc at the Gaudens Danuser Lab at UT Southwestern, although it continued, this is a project that started in 2014 and was just published uh, uh, last month. So yeah, this was my main project. I was lucky that I had other side projects that uh, worked uh, well enough so I could uh, secure my position, but it was published only now, uh, two and a half years into my, my current position. Anyway, we were very lucky uh, to have uh, Sean Morrison as, uh, as a neighbor at UT Southwestern, and Morrison had this fantastic experimental system where they uh, extracted uh, a melanoma, stage three melanoma from patient from limp nodes, and uh, they xenografted them into mice, and then they could correlate the outcome, the outcome in terms of a uh, remote metastasis. So in humans that were treated, uh, uh, there were two types of patients, 
one that uh, the, the the disease was uh, contained and the other where the metastatic just spread all over the place and uh, melanoma went to stage four and then then the survival rates are much lower and it correlated to mice uh, uh, um, uh, where metast metastatic were either confined into it's already metastasis because it's in the lymph node but it was confined to the lymph node and the lungs in the low metastatic efficiency uh, patients and it was all over the place for the high metastatic efficiency patients. So this is the experimental system, and this gives us a, a very powerful physiological re relevant system to now study a metastatic efficiency taking the cells from the, the, the mice. Okay, so we extracted single cells. Uh, we, 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 I mean, we, we, we took the tumor from the mice. We, we, we seeded them on top of uh, collagen, to kind of uh, make it a little bit more similar to the uh, to the actual microenvironment, and we focused on single cells to 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 avoid any information that relates to uh, to to cell to cell communication. Other other properties we wanted to look at the cell autonomous effects here, and uh, you can see this is these are the morphologies. This is just a, a phase contrast microscopy. Uh, you can see that uh, on the one hand, you can see a, a, a variability in, uh, in uh, cell morphology. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, when we stared at images and tried to, to understand which are high and which are low metastasis, we had no, we, we couldn't do, we couldn't find anything visually appealing. So the idea uh, that we did very quickly is trying to extract information from the actual raw images. What we build here is a network that is called an, uh, an autoencoder. Uh, and the idea behind it is if we take an input image and we encode it. How do we encode it? We have a, a part of the network that is called the encoder. Oops. That is called the encoder. And this creates a, a vector, a, a compact representation of the cell appearance. Why is it a compact representation of the cell appearance? Because we can use it in order to reconstruct a full-blown image of uh, the same cell. So basically, we don't give the, the network here any information about whether this cell, cell came from a high metastatic or low metastatic uh, tumor. Actually, we even threw, threw into this uh, uh, training session. So we trained the network to minimize the discrepancy between the input image and the reconstructed image. And the uh, uh, representation here in the middle, this forces the representation to be a compact representation of the cell. We, and we threw in not only the melanoma from patient, but also a melanoma cell lines and also melanocytes. So we threw in whatever data that we had that relate somehow to melanoma to actually get a, a good representation of cell appearance. We didn't give it any information about whether it's a high metastatic or low metastatic uh, tumor. And then what we did, we took the image, we plugged it into the, uh, the network, we got a vector representation. Oh, what's going on? And then we used a, a, a classifier, a, a simple classifier, to distinguish between uh, high and low metastatic efficiency. In this, in this uh, system, for each cell in the LDA classifier, for each cell, we say whether it's a high metastatic, uh, it came from a high metastatic patient or a low metastatic patient. And here you can see at the single cell level, we can distinguish very nicely between uh, high and low metastatic cells. And given since for a tumor, we have many cells, we were very good at distinguishing between a, a high metastatic uh, patient and low metastatic patient. So, so this is great. And we could even validate that uh, experimentally. So we took a bunch of uh, melanoma uh, cell lines. And so all the model was trained and uh, everything was done with, uh, the, the, everything here was done with patient-derived xenograft. Uh, but when, then we took cell lines, which the model didn't see at all. Uh, we used our model to predict uh, which uh, cell line is more aggressive and less aggressive. And then we validate that in, into mice and our prediction uh, held. So we think that, uh, I mean, it's a proof of principle. We had only seven patients with this uh, type of, uh, of uh, uh, labeled annotation of uh, metastatic uh, aggressiveness and also this validation with cell line. We think it's 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 uh, we think it works. Of course, we need more validation validation for that. But in principle, we have a system that now we can uh, take a, a, a patient tumor, a dissected to single cells, image them, and say whether it's a high or low metastatic efficiency. And importantly, no other method was able to do that. So we looked at morphology, 
we looked at at, at, at uh, we used bioinformatics tools. Nothing, nothing worked. I mean, this was the only method that actually worked, which is shows that you the power of what's going on here. But the question is, I mean, okay, fine. Uh, we can, we can, we can use it as a tool to to predict higher low metastatic efficiency. So what? I mean, can we understand what's going on? What the model have learned? What in the cell appearance made the model say that this is a high metastatic cell and this is a low metastatic cell? So yeah, what are the physical attributes? So the the, the first attempt was uh, was uh, was uh, pretty simple. Uh, what I did is extract just images of cells and and uh, and rank them according to what the classifier thought about them, and just stared at, at these images and trying to look for patterns for what what the classifier has caught. Why this cell is red is really bad, and this cell is uh, is not bad. And staring at these images and many thousands of these images, there is nothing. I mean, I couldn't see anything uh, with my eyes. And why? Because there are a lot of uh, reasons for variability between cells that are not relevant at all to the metastatic efficiency, right? So the variability within the data that is not specific to the function of the cells is, uh, is confounding the, the, our ability to actually capture what's going on. Okay, so in order to solve that, uh, eventually we didn't know what to do, but yeah, but eventually what we did, we turned it into something uh, completely different, morphing, uh, in this case, celebrity faces. So uh, what we did, we used uh, a very similar technique to what is uh, used here. Basically, what we did, we took into consideration, we into action the decoder. So we took the vectors that represent a real cell, and then we learned how to push it into the high metastatic domain or to the low metastatic domain artificially while fixing all other cellular properties. So we can push the vector from a low metastatic domain from a, to a high metastatic domain. And now we can use the decoder that actually can generate realistic cell images. And now we can see gradually shifting a cell from a low metastatic domain to a high metastatic domain and see what changes while everything else is fixed. So here you can see cells changing from low to high or from high to low. And when we looked at these images and we had a lot of replicates and we found that it's very, it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's replicated and it's specific. We found uh, 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 two properties that uh, were correlated to the metastatic efficiency. One was change in the, in the light scattering. Uh, and the other was like mini protrusions uh, that, that came out that you could just not see them in the in the raw images, but once you 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 um, amplify the phenotype, you can actually see it. So this is a method to amplify subtle phenotypes. And then to validate that, uh, we we turned into live cell images. We find cells that that you know they come they come from a specific tumor, so they are high or low. But the classifier is not perfect. So the classifier thought that they were changing from high to low. And we can use that uh, data to actually validate what we found. And we were able to validate our, our uh, observation. So basically, we think that uh, metastatic efficiency is associated with the combination of enhanced protrusive activity, and which was, it was more, more hard to see that and to validate that. But increased light scattering was, uh, was very uh, dominant. We don't know what is the reason for the increased light scattering. It could be a lot of reasons. And now, you know, but, but we have an hypothesis. So now we can start understanding what, what, what is behind that. So, I mean, it's more general from that. This project is about uh, interpret how to, an idea about how to interpret uh, uh, these very powerful models that we get from deep learning. And the idea is to take subtle phenotype and un amplify their, them in silico uh, to generate images with amplified features so we can uh, interpret them. And now we're trying to take similar ideas and to take them to different uh, to different domains and different uh, applications. Uh, maybe next year I can tell more, more about that. Okay. So the second uh, project I want to tell you about is uh, what we call collective intelligence or understanding the basic components or building blocks of uh, collective uh, cell behavior. And the general question is, uh, collective cell behavior uh, is, uh, is everywhere. Uh, development, disease, it, it appears all over the place. And usually uh, when we want to study collective cell behavior, what we do 
is that we perturb our system, we measure something at the global scale, at the collective scale, and then we see how it changes. And from that, we learn a function to the genotype phenotype, or, or, or we understand how the perturbation changed the collective behavior. Another way to look at it is uh, going to the single cell level and measuring single cell properties and uh, correlating again how it changes according to a perturbation. Uh, we're, we're taking a different approach from that, a bottom up approach. Uh, what we're trying to do is to model a collective uh, cell behavior as a network. And basically, uh, we take time series, which could be many things. I'll show you a few examples in uh, the next few slides of the single cells to define uh, uh, how each uh, how pairs of cells influence each other. And from that, we can build the network, and then we can see how information propagates uh, between this network, from the for example, from the local scale to the global scale. Uh, we are a completely a dry lab. We are completely a computational lab. So we are privileged to have uh, access to many great collaborators. Uh, and basically, most of our research is based on collaboration, some on public data sets, but, but mostly on collaborations. Uh, I think it's a very rewarding way to do science. It's a lot of fun. We have access to a variety of, uh, of uh, cell systems. And, uh, and uh, we can think very differently. We have uh, the privilege to, to not be limited to a specific cell system, but, but to ask a general question, and then to actively look for the best system to, to answer these questions. So uh, I'm going to show you quickly two examples, and then I'm going to focus on the third example. Uh, one is a communication, mechanical communication between uh, cells through the ECM. And this is uh, with Ayala Klesman from Tel Aviv University. And the cool thing about that, this system, is that we can actually see what you see here are uh, fibroblast cells embedded in uh, fibrin in 3D. And what you, we can actually see the communication goes between the cells by the change of the microenvironment. So this is why we picked this system. And uh, with Mike Overholzer from uh, uh, Sloan Catering Cancer Center, we are looking at the uh, autonomous and non-autonomous uh, form of uh, cell death. Uh, how cell death propagates within a population in some, some of, of program cells, as this is the case. And uh, the, the cool thing about that, from my perspective, is that the, uh, the network is sim simpler than a general network, because once a cell dies, it dies, and it's not going to create feedback loops, uh, at least to some extent. And this uh, creates a simpler networks. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talk is this project with a, a Bosan from Oregon State University. And the student who led this uh, project is uh, Amos Zamir. And this is a project about collective synchronization. OK, so quickly, just to show you a, a, a couple of examples of the first two projects, and then I'll go to the, to the third. Sorry, I forgot that uh, Yeah, this is a seminar, so I had more time. I prepared a few more slides for that. Uh, so what you see here are two uh, fibroblast cells that are communicating mechanically and creating a band uh, between them over time. And what Asaf did, he devised a method to uh, look in between the cells in 3D, measure the fluctuations in the, in the ECM over time, and he devised a correlation-based uh, method to define a unique signature uh, between communicating cells uh what what we used it for uh first uh, to you know just to say as a toy we could show that uh, uh, we can show that each pair of cells we can we can find which cells are communicating with one another this means that there is a unique uh, signature of communication between each pair of communicating cells and this means that the the machinery works that the measure actually measures something that is uh, uh, specific and uh, unique you also uh, use and then we use this technique to show that the uh, uh, even without forming this band of densified fiber, the cells are still communicating, and we can uh, we can even though it's a contractility driven uh, mechanism, we can extract more, take out most of the contractility, reduce most of the contractility, and still the cells are are communicating. So this is a tool that can be used now to decipher cell to cell mechanical cell to cell communication. And the second project is about collective cell death. Uh, this is a project led uh, by uh, Michelle from uh, Mike Overholzer lab and three undergraduate students, Liran, Chen, and Tom, uh, developed quantitative measures to measure the spatial temporal uh, propagation of death. What you can see here in the image, the death is uh, the, the, the green spots that appear. 
over time. This is a, a fluorescent marker within the cell nucleus that, uh, that uh, erupts out once the nucleus uh, ruptures in a form of cell that's called ferroptosis. So they develop tools to measure uh, how, the, how this uh, propagates. And Yeshaya is taking this now a step ahead and is defining measures for autonomous versus non-autonomous uh, decision-making in terms of cell death. And we call it nucleation, the cells that are the weakest in the group and initiate, they are the first to die uh, uh, in response to the external stress that the cells experience. And uh, then propagation, how cells uh, next to it uh, decide to die because the cell dies, so the, the non-autonomous effect of cell death. And using this uh, decoupling to two measures, we can now start to characterize, quantitatively characterize different uh, forms of cell death and put them on a scales here. Uh, so for example, uh, the well-known apoptosis is, is, is dominated by nucleation, so cell autonomous decision-making to die, but there is a component of propagation uh, within uh, apoptosis, uh, while ferroptosis, which is an iron-dependent form of cell death, is dominated by uh, propagation, by non-autonomous cell death. So we need only one weak, uh, wimpy cell to die because of the external stress. Everybody else are, are tough and stay alive. But once one cell dies, it convinces all its neighbors to die, and then, then you see propagation. And this is what dominates in peroptosis. Okay, and in the rest of my time, I'm going to talk about, uh, about the project on uh, synchronization in calcium dynamics. Uh, so uh, what you see here is a monolayer of endothelial cells. Endothelial cells fall, form the barrier between uh, the bloodstream and the, 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 the muscles, uh, the smooth muscle cells uh, between them and control, uh, the, and basically they control the contraction in response to change in the shear stress that is caused by the, by the bloodstream uh, flow change. So basically this is a sensory organ that needs to adjust its internal signaling collectively to the shear stress that, uh, that is changing uh, over time. What you see is the calcium dynamics uh, of these uh, cells, which we use as, as, as our readout. So what Bosan did, he devised a very nice microfluidic device that allowed to control very precisely the shear stress that the cells are experiencing. And he was able uh, to, to create this type of uh, periodical shear stresses that creates the different cycles. And this allows us to actually see how, how the cells as a collective are, uh, are adjusting their signaling state in response to a periodical shear stress. So when we looked at the calcium dynamics and we looked at the, more technically, the derivative of the change of the, of the calcium dynamics, uh, what we can see in black here is the average signal. So you can see very clearly the cycles, the change in the shear stress and how the cells respond to it. What you can also see in green is the variability. So you can see that the beginning, at the beginning there is a lot of variability, which means that the system is not synchronized. And over time, the system is becoming more and more synchronized. You can see less variability, so the system synchronizes to the external signal. First, you can think that maybe it's a single cell uh, 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 mechanism. So each single cell is, is, is adjusting to the external stress and it's adjusting its signaling. This is not the case here. Uh, when we, when we uh, deplete, uh, when we inhibit gap junctions, we can see that uh, this system is uh, not synchronizing anymore, which means that this is a uh, uh, we, gap junctions are, are responsible for uh, chemical communication between uh, cells that are touching each other. And basically, this means that uh, you, you must have some form of uh, local communication in order to form this global synchronization. And the question is how? So uh, we wanted to model the system as a network. Uh, the signal of each cell was the calcium dynamics. And here we turned for, to methods for uh, information theory that were used already extensively in uh, economics. And the specific me measures that we used here was uh, it's called Granger causality. Basically, uh, we use one time series history to, to see how it contributes to the prediction of the future uh, of another time series uh, in another cell. You can think about it in reality, in, in economics, this was used already for, uh, for predicting uh, uh, markets, which markets is influencing each other. So imagine that the uh, 
cell A is the stock market in New York and cell B is the stock market in Hong Kong. And uh, if, we can, if we can find that the past of uh, New York is helping to predict the future of Hong Kong, then we can say that there is A is influencing B, New York is influencing Hong Kong, we, and we can become, of course, uh, very rich. In our case, we just use it to define the uh, relations of uh, how one cell is influencing the other. And this is an asymmetric relation. So now we define it a single cell two uh, measurements. One is the transmission for, uh, score, which is the uh, ability of a cell to influence cell in its local vicinity. And the other is the receiver score, and it's the how a cell is susceptible to influence by its uh, neighbors. And basically, now when we look at uh, this network of cells and we, we measure the receiver and transmission score, first we can see a lot of uh, spatial heterogeneity, and second we can see that the uh, uh, the communication grows a long time. So you can see that uh, the cells are becoming darker in both channels. We can see that the cells are more and more communicating over time. We get more and more edges in this uh, network. Okay, so this is, okay, so we get more information flow. We get more information flowing in this network, and this is correlated to the enhanced uh, synchronization. Uh, but the question is still, is it a single cell property or is it, or is it uh, something that is just, is it an uh, intrinsic cell property or is it just something that every cell take a different role in each uh, cycle? And uh, what we did here is look at the single cell level and correlate the transmission, the receiver score over consecutive cycles. And what we find here, first we found positive correlation, which means that cells remembered what they had some memory uh, of what was the role in the communication network in the previous cycle and they may maintain that actually even reinforced. So we see a change, a growth in the, in the correlation, which means that there is a memory and this memory is reinforced over time. So cells uh, uh, take different roles in the communication network and they enforce them over, this role is reinforced over time. So encouraged by that, we wanted to ask uh, what are single cell properties and how they are linked to the collective synchronization. So we defined the uh, different uh, uh, regions here in the receiver and transmitter score space. Uh, we have individual scale, uh, cells which are just not responsive to, they're not influencing and not be, being influenced by anyone. Common cells, which are the uh, average uh, in terms of their communication properties. Leaders are influencing other cells. Followers are influenced by other cells. And the coolest are the communication hub cells. And which are cells that can uh, can influence and uh, can uh, and are being influenced. So basically, these are cells that are promoting spread of information within the system. They they receive information, transmit information uh, much more effectively than other cells in the in this network. And looking at the, how these roles evolve over time, not surprisingly, you see that it goes to the upper uh, right side. Basically, you get more cells that are communicating, you get more leaders, more hubs, more followers, uh, you get more information flow within the system. Uh, this is not surprising. And also when we look at the fraction of cells uh, taking roles in this network, we can see that the roles that are uh, relate to less communication, the common and individual, their fraction in the population are, are decaying, the fraction of uh, cells that are uh, related to high, high ability to communicate, Follower, leader, and communication hub are, are enriched in the in the population over time, which means again, I mean, cells take different roles, and and, and roles that are correlated to communication are enriched over time. And then we looked at the transitions uh, between roles. So uh, whether a single cell, uh, we know already that there is a memory. So what we see here is basically a measure for how 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 we are surprised. By the, by, by the roles that cells take from uh, one cycle to the next cycle. Uh, value of one means that uh, we are not surprised and we all, only marked here edges uh, of uh, values that are above one. So first you can see the memory here with the self edges. And you can see a very interesting and the most dominant edge here is a self edge for the, in the communication hub roles, which means that one cell, become, uh, one cell becomes a communication hub, it tends to stay in that role and, and, and basically this allows, you know, once a cell is good at communicating, it's going to stay good at communicating. And this is going to, over time, it's going to enrich the population of a uh, communication hub role and improve the communication capacity of the collective. And basically we can see that the 
the direction is here from less communication to more communication. Okay, and finally, in order to uh, show that, uh, I mean, we had this hypothesis that the thirds are first communicating locally and understanding the role in the communication network locally, and over time, uh, with the communication hub uh, uh, cells, uh, the information is spread from the local scale to the global scale. And in order to test this hypothesis, what we did, we looked at the, the probability of having edges to a, a further distances over time. So we wanted to see whether there is change in edges when we look for, for local edges and to edges that can, can be a, to, to, a, to a larger spatial scales. And the way we did it, uh, we correlated the topological distance to the probability of having an edge, to the probability of having a communication edge within this network. So we looked at different topological distances. So these are uh, topological distance neighboring uh, the direct neighbors and further neighbors, etc. And we correlated the topological distance to the probability of having these uh, edges. And if information is confined locally, we are expecting to see uh, something like this. So uh, we, are, we are expecting to see that the negative correlation and cells that are closer to one another are communicating better than cells that are further apart. And if information has reached far, we're expecting to see something like this. Cells that are closer to one another are already synchronized, but cells that are further apart, you can see more, you, you can measure more communication. So here are the experimental results, which are, I think are striking. What you see here with the big data points are the correlation. So you see, and these are in the x-axis is cycle. So you can see that at the beginning of the experiment, we see negative correlations. So cells that are closer to one another are better at communicating with one another than cells that are further apart. And when we go through time, we see this gradual transition to a, a, a global communication where, the, where, where there is, the cells that are closer to one another are already synchronized. And uh, what we can measure is actually a higher probability of edges uh, to further distance, to cells that are located further uh, away. So the, to sum up, uh, we see that heterogeneity in the communication roles that cells take, memory and information flow contribute to the collective information processing. Basically, single cells, there is a lot of heterogeneity within the system. And at the beginning, single cells learn their local environment. They start by knowing and, uh, the role in, uh, with their uh, local neighborhoods. Uh, communication hub roles are becoming uh, more uh, prominent and more uh, enriched in the population and are, are, are allowing the better uh, propagation information from the local to the global scale. And through time, this information propagates and, and the system becomes uh, synchronized. So this is our, our model. Uh, I just want, so this is, this is it. Um, my talk is uh, done. I just want to highlight a, a course that I'm teaching every second semester. So I just finished the uh, uh, this year course uh, it is called data science and cell imaging basically it's a graduate course in my uh, department so it's aimed for a uh, computer applied computer scientists uh, but it's also open to anyone else and uh, this year we had some uh, students from uh, biological backgrounds and from different universities i'm making all the course material uh, open uh, including the lectures and uh, if you're interested in that, then please check it out and you can drop me an email, I can send you the lectures or you can join. So in Australia, it's probably a problem, but uh, in principle, you can join or watch the recording later. And of course you have access to the course material. And I'm very, I would be uh, very happy if someone takes this material and teaches a similar course somewhere else. And to summarize, uh, I mean, I'm computer scientist by training, but everybody knows now that the, the most exciting and the important problems are in uh, biology. So the nails, we have a very uh, powerful toolbox, uh, but the most uh, interesting nails are, are in uh, biology. And of course, what we need to do is bridge that and make uh, cell biologists a little more data scientists and data scientists a little more cell biologists. And this will give more tools to the cell biologist and, uh, and in more interesting problems to the computer scientist and uh, we'll have a better world, et cetera. Uh, thank you, I'm done. Uh, uh, this is my lab. Uh, thanks to everybody here and uh, that's it.
thanks for that answer. That is uh, that's a really good talk. I really like the last one where you had that image of the hammer and nails. I think you could all that is that, that explained things really well. <laughs> so, uh, are there any questions? Um, just having a look at the chat, I don't see any there. So, if anyone has any, uh, oh yeah, I think there's one question in the chat. Okay, so. Jeff Jeffrey Leach is asking, how important is computer processing? Is com how important is computer processing increases in these AI techniques? I'm yeah, I'm assuming it's a computer processing power, or sorry, or is it a computer? I'm I'm, I'm not clear actually. Uh, how important is computer processing increases in these AI techniques? That's the question. Yeah. Or computing power. Yeah. Power. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, it is important, but uh, nowadays uh, with modern computation, you don't need a super powerful cluster uh, to, I mean, it's, it's very helpful, but uh, for most applications, you don't need the super powerful computers. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in, the, in all the projects that relate for cell-to-cell -cell communication that I showed you, you really don't need a special computer. I mean, the, the analysis is pretty, you know, it takes time building this network in uh, with many cells, etc. It, it takes time, but it's not, you know, it's not a disaster. You can even use it. A powerful, a powerful laptop will will even work. Uh, we use the cluster because we have access to one, but but you can do this type of uh, analysis on a much uh, smaller uh, scale with computational power. Deep learning techniques do uh, require computational power. Again, today. Uh, you can train models on on a designated uh, machine. You don't need to be one of these huge labs with uh, a super computational power. So to train these models, you do need some uh, uh, minimal computational uh, power and uh, GPUs, etc. It's not super expensive these days, so you can you can actually purchase this in, even in a biological lab, etc. I mean, even in a in a non uh, uh, computational cluster. Uh, once a model is trained, again, you are back to, you don't need any extensive computational power. Once you have a model, you can actually use it. It's very easy and, and very, uh, it doesn't require anything special. Thanks, Matt. Um, so also, uh, I'll ask one. So with the, can with the cancer cell part of your talk, which you're talking about, um, like uh, how, big, how big was the data sort of you use and how many sort of images you had? Uh, did you have there? Also, I'm assuming you probably have to do a lot of cleanup of the, uh, uh, I guess cleaning the data in the sense that you have to organize everything and clean the data up and say, okay, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. But, I mean, yeah, just, just curious about that. Um, so we had all together, we had the 12,000 cells uh, with time series. Uh, cleaning the data is, I think, is a big, is a big point. So uh, especially the question what you can throw, right? I mean, it's a, uh, so we threw data that was, uh, the, the, the images looked really bad. We didn't, you know, we just threw this data. The rest, we didn't throw anything. And I, I even kept, we even kept data where the tracking didn't work perfectly, segmentation didn't work perfectly. I mean, we still kept everything. So I, I'm, 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 I'm very, we did put a lot of attention, for example, day-to-day -day variability, right? I mean, it was a big deal in this project. I didn't talk about it at all, uh, but I, I'm putting a lot of effort in, 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 in uh, in uh, a lot of attention in, in, in uh, not ignoring these things. In principle, I, I would be very careful in throwing data out. And if you throw data out of your analysis, you need to have a very clear uh, decision why to do it and how to do it across all your data. In our case, it was 12K cells. Each of them had a time series. So we had, uh, uh, um, actually we had uh, a couple of millions, I think, of, uh, of single cell images. Okay. All right, so there's a question in the chat from uh, Marilo. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing the name right. Uh, so that's a really cool technology. Can you also quantify vesicles that transfer between cells? I imagine having them tagged is easier, but what if you want to monitor untagged vesicles as tagging might affect transport? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking for, for one of these systems of, uh, having exosomes and looking how they go from one cell to another and how the cell changes its state. I mean, I would love to have this system. Currently, I didn't find the right collaborator for that. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have a good answer about the tagged or untagged vesicles. 
uh, it will have to be solved with a collaborator. But if 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 uh, you know of anyone that is interested, I, I I'm I'm interested. <laughs> Right, possible collaborations there. Um, so I guess I follow up on that maybe on the collaboration side of things. I mean, um, when you when you get that sort of when you have like say biologists sort of approaching you, what has been, what is the sort of thing that makes I guess make it easier for you to sort of understand uh, like what exactly the question is and and what sort of data to have. Uh, what what is a perfect sort of scenario for you if someone approaches you with a certain certain problem? I guess just to make sure the communication is easier. I guess because a lot of the time that's where collaborations I feel like fall apart. It's you know, okay, say you want to do this. You said yeah, maybe, and then it sort of fizzles out perhaps because it wasn't really clear on what exactly everyone wanted. Um, so right. So the two. I think the two best tips are to to collaborate with nice people and to have open <laughs> that, that you feel that you know I'm dependent on this collaboration. I, I have to be a good collaborator, and I don't want to collaborate with people who are, I, I don't I, I will not have fun time working with. Uh, so so you need to to pick your collaborators very carefully. And if something you know, if I see that uh, so this is this is one one thing that is there, and and then. And then also you align expectations, right? So you say, what is the common problem that we are both interested in? And sometimes we do analysis. It is not like the main things that you want in order to help our collaborators. And sometimes they do experiment to help us. And basically sharing credit in the, in paper. So I'm, you know, in this paper, we were the dry in the paper, for example, of uh, of the, the the calcium signaling or the cell ECM cell communication. It was we were the drivers of the the project, and uh, at the end, we 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 offered the co co corresponding authorship to uh, my collaborator. Uh, even Bosan so told me, for example, this is your project. It was all the data we already had. It's yours. I said no. Wait, this is a collaboration. I'm looking at beyond one collaborator. I want to have a, a further. I, I want to work with you further. I want both of us to be happy. And immediately once once I did that, something changes change. So. Uh, he was willing to do more experiment. It was so, you know, this is the the reward, the reward mechanism in in the academia, and I think we can do better together than each one apart. About approaching people and people approaching, so there it goes both ways. The way that I do it, I the three collaborations that you see here, actually, I approach the my collaborators. So I saw cool papers or cool talks. So I I work every year in ACB in the American Society of Cell Biology. It's like a candy shop, all these fantastic systems. And uh, I get to see all of them and talk to all these uh, wonderful uh, people. And, and you know, it's like a candy shop. I have this general idea of communication. <laughs> I can try to find the systems that and the people that best match what I want to study. And uh, this is one way. So I'm approaching people. Both and I approach with an email. Hey, I saw this paper. It's a great paper. I want to, do you want to collaborate? And then we had a few meetings. We just met a year and a half after we started the collaboration, and we were like already the best friends. Uh, we, it was immediately going to be was very natural to us because uh, it worked so so smoothly. This is one way. When biologists approach me, there are two types of uh, approaching me. One is uh, asking for a service. So hey, we have these images. We want to quantify that. Uh, can you help us with that? As this I need this uh, as a PI. I mean, I'm measured on my, you know, on my my research program. I need to be very careful about the, about this type of collaborations. I help people sometimes if I think, you know, one there are, and there are different uh, motivations. Uh, one was because the person really needed this paper for tenure, right? So I said, okay, yeah, sure. I, I'm not really interested, but I'll help you. But and 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 in this in this type of collaboration, but I need to be careful not to put too much time in that. And in this type of collaborations, I also need to be, um, uh, and, and you need to understand really what is the question, because sometimes the, 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 the biologist doesn't necessarily know. I had a, well, anyway, this is one way. And the other is uh, saying, yeah, we saw your talk, uh, cell cell communication, blah, blah, blah. Here is the, we have this cool system. Are you interested? And then we come together usually with a, with a specific question. All right, thanks, Sarah. So, uh, sorry, in the interest of time, we may have to stop it over there. I think there is a question from Nina, but what I'll do is I'll forward it uh, on to you so you could pro pro perhaps answer uh, Nina. But uh, otherwise, look, thank thanks a lot, Asa. We really appreciate you making the time for us, and it was a pleasure to have you here for the ATV seminar. And with that, uh, we'll yeah, we'll close it off. So thank you. Thank you.